and then we'll pass. Thanks, Tim. And then we'll pass over to Libby Bowles of Sustainable Hive, who is going to tell us a little bit about Bristol Harbour's new best friend. Hooray, thank you very much indeed. Right, I'm just going to share. Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, let me just pop it onto slideshow. Yes, okay, brilliant. So thank you very much indeed um, for having me here this evening. And I know it's a lovely sunny evening. So thank you to those who've um, come and shown up and um, are here and smiling and happy and raring to go. So I'm here to talk to you this evening about a sea cycler and how we in Bristol are turning the tide on marine litter. Um, hopefully I can get to the next slide. Okay, so my name is Libby S. Grantstead. Um, just to give you a little bit of background information about why I should be a person to listen to talking um, about plastic pollution and waste in the water. Um, I've got a background of teaching. Um, I spent six years working as a primary school teacher in London and also a couple of other spots around the world. And I've spent about six years working underwater in four different continents, um, monitoring plastic pollution um, around the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef in Mexico and running a research center in um, Mozambique. And during that time, I was there for three years and we performed necropsies on various dead animals that we found in the sea and almost um, entirely found them to have a lot of plastic and various other man-made debris in their stomach. So it's something that I care about very much and has led me um, back to the UK to work for Sustainable Hive, which is an education consultancy. So I feel um, a little bit... Um, well qualified to talk to you this evening about um, plastic pollution and how we can help with that in our waterways. Um, so Sea Cycler is this beautiful boat you can see on the screen right now. She is um, a plastic punt and um, runs in a very economical and environmentally friendly way. So this is a picture of her on the day of the um, launch where the Lord Mayor came down, as you can see him there, dressed a little bit like Captain Cook, uh, Captain Hook, sorry. And um, it was brilliant while we had people down there taking pictures. The Matthew went past in the background with a bunch of kids um, on it, hanging off the side, screaming, Captain Hook, Captain Hook. So there she is um, on the high seas of Bristol Floating Harbour. Um, she's made from 99% recy recycled um, PET plastic. So she's made from around um, 8,000 plastic bottles, and they are created with... Um, uh, using bottles to make plaswood and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a moment. She's also got an electric motor so when she's chugging about on the harbour there's no nasty fumes coming out. Um, it's a very environmentally friendly way to get around the harbour and um, she weighs about a ton and she's made from about 8,000 plastic bottles which my slides seem to be having a little funny moment here. Um, so yes, about 8,000 plastic bottles went to make up the Sea Cycler. And she's really special because there's only six of these in existence. And she lives tucked away just next to the grain barge under a cover. So if you want to go and have a look at her, she's um, moored with um, young Bristol and is under a blue cover most of the time. And then when we come out, we put up these banners on the side, which um, tell everyone that she's made from recycled plastic. Okay. So she is a 10-seater plaswood punt, and um, plaswood is um, when they melt PET bottles down and make them into something that looks like wood. So on the top right-hand side, you can see this um, street sign, and these, are, these posts are made from plaswood, so it's made out of plastic and kind of looks like wood. You can see some examples of decking here where they've really gone into a lot of detail and even put the grain of um, wood printed into the plastic so they look very kind of um, natural, as it were. So what happened was we had one boat at the beginning several years ago. It went around and collected enough plastic bottles to make a second boat and so on and so it went on like that and the um the queen's um 
Gloriana Barge Maker is um, a very nice man called Mark Edwards in Richmond and he's made us this um, plaswood punt so he makes these using really traditional boat making methods and our boat was made in um, Richmond and joined us here in Bristol last year. So the inspiration came from a project in Amsterdam called Plastic Whale, which was really amazing and combined sightseeing with cleaning up the city's canals. And then um, here in the UK, a lady named um, Christine Armstrong, who's um, a circular economy champion and author, and Paul Bew, who's the Dockland Sailing Club um, owner and a local school in Canary Wharf, um, set up a pilot project. And it was cleaning up the docks, um, getting valuable plastics and inspiring the next generation um, of students to become kind of eco warriors. Bristol um, hosted this boat, um, the first one that went round. I think it was either called the Polly Roger or um, the Polly Mer. So there's some really, really great piratey um, names going on there, weaving in the plastic, and we've ended up with a sea cycler. So we had this boat um, here in 2018, I think, or 19, and it was in Bristol for a month and toured around. Um, different cities in Bristol, uh, in the UK, sorry, collecting plastic, um, all getting ready to make the subsequent boats. And then we've been the first place outside of London that's been gifted one of these permanently. So um, having a think about why we would want to go plastic fishing in the harbour, in um, a couple of years ago, Hubbub did a um, questionnaire, um, a survey, and 64% of people felt like they were just really helpless when it came to wanting to tackle the ocean litter crisis. So we're kind of empowering people to feel like they're doing something about that, which is really, really important to feel empowered and to feel like we're doing something and making a difference. Um, and we are making a difference right in our local ecosystem. So every year we know that around 8 million tonnes of litter enters the world's oceans. So doing something about that on our own doorstep is great. And it really gives a lot of people the opportunity to experience firsthand the impact of our lifestyle and ours, meaning the kind of wider lifestyle, not just us personally on the local environment. Um, it's really interesting. So we spend a lot of time going kind of around the Arnold Feeney and that area near the watershed where there's a lot of um, plastic cups being used and just kind of entering the waterways very quickly. So it's really lovely to be able to get in right unmute and um and and have an effect on what's going on right there um so plastic fishing there's two of us who skipper the mighty sea cycler both of us are royal yacht association um are qualified um skippers we've got first aid and vhf radio training as well so we're um the good people for looking after you when you're out on the boat and we're brimming with local knowledge and enthusiasm so as well as um coming out with us and having a bit of information all about um plastic pollution and what's going on in the waterways we've also got quite a lot of information about the local area so it's a really nice way to get to know a bit more about the um the bristol harbour and um and the city um, so you learn about marine plastics, you learn a little bit about the circular economy and recycling, and I'm really excited that Noelia from um, Bristol Waste is going to be having a chat with us shortly because she is full of information and um, she has been around to take on lots of the rubbish that we've collected over the last year using the sea cycler and she's been um, a really great help and a mine of information. Um, donations that we receive from corporate volunteering coming out with us on Sea Cycler enable us to uh, make education resources. So our um, dream is that we're using the Sea Cycler to take people out on um, corporate social responsibility days, on volunteering days. And then with um, donations that we receive, we can basically make amazing resources. We're all ex-teachers working at Sustainable Hive, and then we can deliver these um, outreach resources into schools kids can learn about um what's going on in the waterways have some math lessons english lessons all that kind of thing related to plastics and then come out with us on the boat and actually bring all of that learning to life and we all know that you kind of once you get involved in doing something that's when you're really remembering and learning well 
So yes, um, bringing all these issues to life right in the heart of Bristol. And it's also a really wonderful way to see Bristol from another point of view. So we would like Sea Cycler really to be a well-known and valued asset to the city. Already there's lots of people that we see when we're out and about and um, with the banners up on the side saying that we're made out of recycled plastic, it's a really lovely way to engage with people and we always get people kind of shouting from the side, Are you really, is that boat really made of plastic and how can I come on it and all that kind of thing, so it's great. So we'd love to see businesses regularly hopping on board for um, their volunteers day, we want to take Bristol schools out so we can run workshops and curriculum linked learning and take them on a litter picking trip and really bring environmentalism and learning to life because as we know that's when people are hooked in, that's when they get passionate and that's when they want to do something to, um, to help. And also to give people a greater, greater understanding of the impact of um, plastic and litter in our waterways, why it's bad to have that plastic there, what it actually means kind of chemically when animals are eating plastic and it's being ingested by um, animals in the water. And eventually we want to create a big fat behaviour shift in the city, which is what all of us want. Um, so it's really nice to be here with like minded people. Now, that was um, really quick. So thank you um, very much for listening. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free or um, do hit us up with any questions um, on ccycler.org.uk as well, if you don't think of anything this evening. But otherwise, um, thank you very much. Thanks, Libby. That's really exciting. I really hope all the businesses especially in the centre there, whose colleagues are going out and buying takeaway stuff and probably inadvertently at least contributing to the waste in the water, sign up and come out with you. Yeah, it's been really great. We've got um, quite a few um, companies asking to come out with us at the moment, which is really brilliant. And um, we can build kind of um, whole day activities for people. So we, um, as well as doing Sea Cycler, we can drop multiple groups of people. So we have um, the um, Blackbeard's Banksy tour, um, walking tour is an alternate thing that we can do. We've got silent disco litter picking that we can incorporate. And also rather than everyone going and buying plastic wrap stuff at lunchtime, we can also combine that all with a lunch booking somewhere kind of close to the harbour. So we've got lots of opportunities. It's not just kind of a boat ride. Okay, cool. Question came in from Helen. Can you say a bit about the practical process of picking up the litter from the water? We need lots of trips so you can get it all before it sinks. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, only a very small percentage of rubbish actually stays on the surface once it's in there. So, um, yes, we do want to kind of um, grab all that stuff. We can't get anything that's kind of sunk really to the bottom, as you can imagine. Um, so basically, we sit on both sides of the plastic punt here. There's seating up both sides. And in the middle, we have loads of um, plastic tubs like the one that you can see here in um, in the logo that we've got so there's plastic tubs sitting in the middle we've got litter pickers so um they're kind of big stick litter pickers and we've got a couple of really long ones because we don't want people leaning over the side and being um at risk of falling in um but yeah so we basically grab things we try and sort them out as we go around and then because we want to have the maximum impact um, once we've got all of that, then basically we fill out a form and, you know, we don't want to just be picking up the litter. We want to be recycling as much as we can, but also giving useful information to um, kind of various groups, including um, Bristol Waste, who like to know kind of how much we've picked up of, of what different materials. So we really kind of do it to quite um, a narrow level, very detailed, you know, kind of how many drinks cups we've got, um, what different makes of snacks we've got all the different things we break it down and um, fill in a sheet so we try and make the most of um, the citizen science that we can so gathering lots of data about what we're actually picking up out of the harbour and then does it go off to Bristol Waste or are you saving it for your next boat 
No, absolutely. So um, the, the PET plastic, um, we do record and, and keep, and that will go towards the, um, the next boat being created. For a lot of the stuff that we collected last year, lucky old me and my um, lovely colleague Olivia got to wash a lot of it. And we had um, an artist who came and created um, a sculpture in the Bristol Aquarium. So if anybody's been to the aquarium in the last um, four or five months in the Bay of Rays area, which is that kind of bubble on the back of the aquarium. There's um, a giant sculpture that's made with the rubbish that we picked up out of the harbour. So there's a big octopus which whose legs kind of come down this kind of cliff front. There's what's supposed to be like a water pipe coming out with um, lots of water and then there's all sorts of kind of sea creatures um, in there so a lot of the rubbish is in the Bristol Aquarium but we bag it up we've got all the the different the green and the clear coloured bags from Bristol Waste and then we basically report we weigh everything so we know how much weight of rubbish we've collected and then um, we report to Bristol Waste where it is we take a picture upload that so that Bristol Waste can come and collect it. And that's both kind of landfill stuff that can't be recycled, but obviously all the stuff that, that can be recycled is. Thank you. I think that's answered Julie's question pretty well. Um, Pippa's asked, how can community groups without commercial funding get involved? And um, so, so really basically, in the very short term, um, unfortunately, we're kind of looking for stuff to do with funding. We have, we are going to be taking Sea Cycler out at um, kind of festival opportunities during the summer. So we're going to be out in the Festival of Nature in um, June for a week. Um, I think that's the week, oh, I don't have the dates, but I think it leads up to kind of the 10th, 11th. So it's maybe around the, the 5th of June for a week. Um, also, the um, the Harbour Festival will be having Sea Cycler out and about. But if you get onto the website, you'll be able to sign up. And then um, any when we're taking her out and we do have room for community groups, the people who've um, signed up will be the first to um, to hear about it. So yeah, so that's that's the best way for the moment. Thank you. Cool. I think we'll do one more question, which is all there is at the moment before we move on to Noelia. And if anyone else has got any other questions, we'll, we'll come back to them at the end. So Julie's, Ju Julie's asked if there's any method of getting the sunk plastic and, and also microplastic out of the water. Microplastics, I'm not sure that there is in the harbour. Um, the sunken plastics is quite an interesting one because I was... Um, I had a tour around Underfall Yard and was um, seeing about the sluice gates opening and they were kind of, um, I was also having a discussion with them about what happens with all the plastics at the bottom and when they kind of open the sluice gates or, or a lot of those um, just kind of getting washed out of the sluice gates. Um, and they don't have any, I think I'm right in saying that they don't have bars that kind of are right across the sluice gate. So it is possible for plastic pollution to get out there. So that that is a bit more difficult because obviously you've got, you know, kind of a lot of silt that will be at the bottom of the harbour. Um, so I'm afraid I don't entirely know how we can get that out. Um, yeah, and the plastic, the microplastics is is a really difficult one. I've, I've talked to the council um, and asked them because round is it the river station um or it used to be the river station um restaurant just kind of past like the mud dock cafe um around there on the harbour front there they have like a pontoon and the outside of the pontoon has um been exposed and inside is all polystyrene and there's polystyrene literally kind of just coming off their their pontoon bit into the water so um, especially around there, there's lots of small stuff. And we do have like a little net, but we we can't stop the really tiny stuff. Um, okay. Yeah, that's it. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thanks, Libby. <clears throat> yeah, again, really, 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 really hope it takes off. Thank you. And Grant, you'll have to come for a ride sometime. We'll get you yeah. out. Oh, yes, please. Fabulous. Um, All right, thank you very much. I'll mute myself. But if anyone has any questions, please do um, email or contact us through C-Cycler. And I'm really excited to hear Noelia speak. So thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you so much, Libby. Should I share now? Yeah, go for it, Noelia. 
thank you so much Libby it's it's so funny how um people you know that's Libby's talking about how great I am and all I can think about is how great this is and how great sustainable hive are so yeah the the feeling is mutual um and yeah you will see a little photo in a minute of uh, me on the sea cycler I absolutely love it so um yeah I cannot recommend going on it enough really um okay let me just Sorry, could we just ask Libby to stop sharing her screen that's it thank you yeah good if Libby stops sharing then we can get Noelia up. Can you do that, Libby? Stop sharing. Thank you. I think that's it. Yeah. Great. Okay. Maybe I'll do, yeah, can you see the slides? Yeah, we well, okay. Great. Yeah, it's good. Wonderful. Um, yes, so thank you everybody. Um, yes, as Libby and Grant said, I work for Bristol Waste. I do community engagement. Um, so I do all sorts of talking to people about their bins and problematic materials and reuse and all that all that lovely stuff. Um, I'm also a gardener in my spare time and yeah, uh, can't talk enough about rubbish really. So yeah, <laughs> I'll just go straight into it. So if you don't know too much about Bristol Waste, um, they are owned by the council, so they don't uh, make any profit. All of the money goes straight into back into the council that we make if we make any extra. Um, so yeah, that's what it means by tackle company. Um, so we manage the recycling and residual waste in Bristol across the households and flats and commercial businesses as well. Um, we have two transfer stations. So we have the one in Albert Road and the one in Avonmouth. So that is where all of the waste is processed um, from Bristol. Uh, we also do street cleansing. So you'll see our guys around uh, litter picking and doing all sorts to keep the streets as clean as possible as well. Um, we've got the household reuse and recycling centres. So we've got the one at Days Road. We've got the one at Avonmouth. Both of them have a reuse shop now. So if you haven't been to the reuse shop in at Days Road yet, if that's your local recycling centre, I really recommend going. Um, that's a really, really great way of um, reducing waste by buying something that's really, really cheap, which um, somebody else threw away. So yeah, your treasure that somebody else threw away, which is absolutely amazing. Um, and we've got the new um, site opening at Hartcliffe as well. So that should be open um, sometime this year um and yeah you know about community engagement work because that's me and yeah commercial services as well so we do all sorts around the city um the objectives of Bristol waste are to reduce residual waste to increase recycling and we do this with um change in behavior so this is like one thing that we're really really driven to do we've done lots of really great campaigns um just a few of them are here so slim my waist and bin digestion these are both about people really really thinking about what you throw away in your wheelie bin and actually a lot of the things that people throw away could have been recycled and you can reduce your waste um a lot with just a few little changes and just bearing some things in mind um we also do the waste nothing challenge and the waste nothing schools challenge so um these little characters that you see there um are from the waste nothing schools challenge so yeah we do all sorts in schools and um yeah working with people across across bristol um we want to support circular economy so that's the whole reason why um we really care about all of this really is to you know our mission is definitely to for bristol to waste nothing um and you might have seen our logo which is a big circle and that's in honor of that we want to reduce carbon emissions of course we want to show that um, there is value for money in recycling. Um, it's not just about it being right, you know, the right thing to do for the planet. You know, they are resources that are really valuable in more ways than one. And one of them is financial. So yeah, it is value for money to recycle. Um, and to increase public understanding and engagement and to enhance the Bristol street scene and neighborhoods. So ultimately we just wanna make Bristol as clean and green as we can. 
And yeah, so when it says curbside there, that means um, household, household, individual household collections, sorry. So 80% of Bristol are curbside collections, so individual household collections. Um, and what makes us so successful in terms of having one of the best uh, recycling rates in the whole of the UK is the system that we have in place of separating materials at curbside. So a lot of the hard work that everybody does um, by separating their recycling at home means that the quality of the recycling is really, really high um, and more of it gets recycled, which is great. Um, so all materials leave us separated to gain maximum value and full circular recycling. So I'll go a little bit more into this um, in a minute. Um, Tim asked me the really good question um, before you guys came along about what happens to the recycling materials. We do process them uh, within Bristol, sorry, within the UK. Um, quite a few of them go to Wales, some of them go to Kent. Um, you can look them up on the council website um, and on our webpage as well. And if you ever want to know what, what happens to any of our materials, we'd be more than happy to answer. We'll tell you where they go, um, why they go there. It's, it's all about really um, demand and keeping things as local as possible. Um, so yeah, you can rest assured that your recycling does get recycled um, and most of it does stay within the UK. Um, so something to think about which um, sort of links all of the things that we're talking about together. So what Libby was talking about um, and of course, um, smaller, where smaller footprints is concerned as well, I would say, um, is that ultimately we need to think about the waste hierarchy. So we need to think about that the most important things we can do um, to lower our carbon footprint is to prevent the waste in the first place. So that's the yellow part at the top. Then we need to obviously try to um, prepare the materials that we have bought or attained for some reason um, to reuse them in some way. So thinking about how we can get as many uses out of them as possible. Um, then after that would come recycling and composting. And then after that would come other types of recovery. So energy recovery. So when um, Libby mentioned landfill before, um, the I'll talk a little bit more about this as well, but um, the wheelie bin refuse waste in Bristol, that goes to the energy recovery plan in Avonmouth. So it doesn't actually go to landfill. The majority will be recovered as energy, but I'll go uh, a little bit more into that uh, later on. And then right at the bottom is disposal. So that's just nothing was recovered as energy or recycled or otherwise. Um, so obviously that's the least uh, favorable and least desirable thing that we would want to do. So yeah, if you're not familiar with the waste hierarchy, I really recommend, um, yeah, familiarizing yourself really and thinking about which one you, you know, is any of this new to you? Did you think, oh, I would have thought recycling would be higher up. It's really, it's really interesting um, to think about and um, to realize really that a lot of it is preventing that waste in the first place. So when Grant asked me, oh, Nalia, can you talk a little bit about how we, you know, stop litter get becoming a thing in the first place? A lot of it is about preventing that litter in the first place. Did you need that packaging? Did that need to be something that you needed to throw away in the first place? Or could you have done without it? Um, and then obviously then it's the other steps, you know, could you have taken it home with you? Could you have reused it for something else? Could you have recycled it? Um, and you need to make sure that it's going in the right place, whatever you decide to do, really. So, yeah. Ooh, ooh, sorry, I don't know why it's clicked off. Okay, we're back. Okay, so just a little breakdown of what happens to uh, different types of materials. So uh, these are rough figures from last year. So um, they need to be confirmed, but I tried to get you the most up-to-date um, working figures possible. Um, so we handled 170,000 tonnes of household waste. Approximately 45% of this was recycled. Um, the rates of recycling have lowered um, during the pandemic. Obviously, this is due to a number of reasons, but one of them is obviously with the impact of the pandemic, uh, single use uh, materials have gone up, uh, such as the COVID tests and things like that. Um, 
it's, it's a whole host of reasons, but yeah, recycling has lowered a little bit by a few percentages, but we really, really want to get it back up. And our target is to get that to 60%. Um, so that's something that we're working towards within the next two years. So the other 43% was recovered as energy or materials recovered to be reused. So maybe they weren't immediately recycled, but they ended up being recycled in some way, or they have been recovered as energy, um, like our Avonmouth plant, uh, the Verda one, um, or yeah, reused or recovered in some other way. And then 12% uh, went to landfill. So yeah, obviously this is something that we want to keep as low as possible. Um, it's really not something that we would want to do. Um, it, yeah, it's something that upsets me every day, <laughs> um, for sure, when something doesn't get reused or recycled or, um, yeah, it doesn't go in the right place and it ends up in landfill because obviously we know the, you know, as Libby was talking about, we know that the impact of this is really, really severe. Um, it ends up in our oceans. It ends up, you know, decaying and causing horrible gases in our, in our environment. So, yeah it affects all sorts of wildlife and yeah it's just it's just really something that we really really don't want to do so we're trying to keep that number as low as possible um and we made this video to show everybody what happens at the transfer station at albert road so this is where all of the recycling uh, ends up every day from collections around bristol um so if you haven't seen this video um, hopefully you will be excited to see it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I will just press play now. Can everybody oh, it's clicked back off as an M one second? Sorry about that little technical blip. If I click again, hopefully. This time it work. I don't know why it's not okay. Okay, what I might do is just open it on YouTube. Sorry about this, everybody. Okay, I might just, yeah, I might just open it like that. That's fine. Sorry about the um, the fact that it was small. For some reason, it wouldn't let me put it full screen. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, it is on YouTube though, so if you want to watch that again, um, in case you missed something or it was too small for you, um, yeah, it's it's just called "What Happens to Your Recycling Waste." I'm happy to send you the link if you like, but it is on uh, YouTube. 
Um, yeah, something that people will get quite confused about quite often is, you know, why does plastic and cans go together? And that magnet shows you exactly the process. It shows you how they're separated. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. Uh, that mountain of plastic that you see that can build up from just one day. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's quite something to experience really. Um, yes. And one of the, so that's what happens with everything that you can recycle at home. Uh, one thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of something that we've, uh, started as an initiative in the city centre on commuter routes is the cup bins. So Libby talked about, yeah, finding uh, plastic cups and things like that around. Um, this was something that we introduced in order to try and combat that. So the little QR code um, in the corner, that's just a link to the web page if you're interested to learn more. Um, so obviously a, re a reusable coffee cup is of course the best choice, but thousands of paper cups are thrown away every day in Bristol. We've reprocessed over nine tons of coffee cups. So that's around 750,000 cups. The plastic film lining is removed and the paper gets recycled by the James Cropper paper mill in the Lake District. And this paper will get a second life as high quality paper packaging and stationary products. So if you imagine this would have been just wasted paper um, essentially, and we've managed to rescue it, which is amazing. Um, so yeah, um, we collect this from commercial sites and the commuter routes in the center of the city. Um, on the web page, it shows you a Google map of where they all are. Um, if you wanted to find one closest to where you work or closest to uh, maybe where you walk uh, sometimes in the center. Um, so yeah, you can have a look and find that if you're interested. And so the key thing here um, is that they have to be paper and not plastic cups and not compostable. So um, I will talk a little bit more about uh, compostable materials in a minute. Um, but yeah, much like other recycling materials, the more it is just made from one material, the easier it is to reprocess and recycle. So um, the reason why they are so difficult to recycle in the first place is because they, they are made of so many different types of materials, but because this paper and plastic lining is similar to that of the Tetra packs, there's a process in place which we can use to recover that. So if you put a Tetra pack in your, um, or carton in your blue bag, it is, you know, the cardboard is recovered, but that film lining has to be removed because that plastic, um, lowers the quality of that cardboard if it's processed together and not separately. Um, so yeah, that's just a really golden rule of recycling really, um, which I'll go into more in, in a little bit. Um, food waste, this is another really important one that was touched upon in the video. So um, this one, this is so, so important because people don't realize that it's not just about, um, you know, um, necessarily recycling or turning into something else but this gets made to do different things it gets made into energy for homes in bristol but it also gets made into fertilizer which can be used to grow crops so it creates that circular economy loop which is fantastic um, you can learn, learn a little bit more about the plant that does this jenico in avonmouth on their website if you like i've put the link there and i've also put it in the qr code i'm happy to share these slides afterwards um, but yeah this is like another really good uh Thing that we do with the food waste. Um, like I mentioned with the energy recovery plant at Virador, so this is what happens with general waste. Um, it's quite a complicated um, beast really, it's an amazing piece of engineering. Um, I visited this for the first time a few weeks ago um, and essentially it's a huge boiler that um, boils all of the waste which is not processed in any way, so nothing that goes in there which could have been recycled is guaranteed to be recovered. Um, some of it does come out, so for example, metals and things like that, um, that withstand the heat. Um, but other than that, it will just get recovered um, as energy. And then a small amount of that um, goes to landfill as well. Um, but most of it will be recovered into energy. Um, again, I've put the link, um, the QR code there for Verador's website if you're interested in learning more. Um, but yeah, I'll just read the little quote there. So it says, the process sees treated non-recyclable waste exposed to high temperatures under highly controlled conditions. The energy release is then captured, turned into elect electricity and fed into the national grid. Um, and they've got a few plants like this um, around the UK. 
Um, so, okay, so yeah, I've sort of like mentioned this already, but just to uh, finish explaining that. So the general rule of thumb is that mixed materials are problematic in general. So compostable uh, quotes <laughs> materials are not always accurate. They don't tend to break down very easily. So this is something to check, definitely. Um, when you buy something and they say that it's comp compostable, you need to make sure that that's actually true. Um, the more we can separate materials out without mixing materials, so for example, plastic and paper, the higher the quality of the material and the more it can be recycled again and again. Um, like I said just now, it's really worth checking that the company that made or provided the packaging, um, you know, is there somewhere you can send this to if you can't recycle it at home? Um, it could be that the processing required is not what we have available at Bristol and therefore it would need to go in the general waste bin. And this is what, you know, we get a lot of people saying to us, well, why, why is this thing not recyclable? Well, that's the fault of the manufacturer um, because, you know, they need to make sure that what they're, the material that they're using is not difficult to recycle. Um, and the problem with compostable especially is that it needs to, um, it has a very, very high boiling point, for example, and maybe is really, really difficult to try to get that to break down in the first place. So yeah, you may need a different technology for it, basically. Um, one really good thing to do is remove labels um, and remove lids that are a different material. So let's say you have a wine bottle with a plastic lid. It's really good to separate those. Um, again, any little bit of material that's different, if they get recycled together, it's just going to um, contaminate the recycling is what we call it. It's just going to make the quality of the that material um have a mix of things in it rather than stay pure if you like um, it would be like a drop of milk in a glass of water essentially um, so obviously ideally we would yeah want to try and reduce that as much as possible so every little thing you can do to separate materials is a really good thing um, so I'm just going to quickly talk about three uh, problematic materials that we don't accept um, at household collection at the moment one of those is wrapping paper. So this is a very big uh, topic around Christmas time, of course. Um, the reason is, is that it's lined with a lot of foil and plastic. Um, if it's just brown paper, that's absolutely fine. It can go with your brown paper and your, and your cardboard and your blue back. No worries at all. If it's got a little bit of paint on there, so you can see that picture, it's got some potatoes um, that people have used as stamps. If it's got a little bit of paint, that's absolutely fine. As long as it's not covered in paint, um, you can recycle it essentially. So yeah, it doesn't mean no paper whatsoever. It just means no plastic lined or foil paper. Um, the other one is black plastic. Um, the reason for this is that the black plastic, it's very difficult for our infrared um, detector to penetrate through the plastic and actually recognize it as plastic. Um, so it actually gets it confused with the conveyor belt, which is also black. Um, so yeah, it's it's one of those to keep an eye out for. Um, a little tip is that most black plastic is actually dark gray. So you can do a little light test, um, just hold the, paper, the plastic up to the light. And if you can see light coming through it, it's probably just dark gray. Um, it's actually very, very difficult to um, create completely black pigmented plastic. So it's probably just dark gray which means you can recycle it. And then the last one is, of course, plastic films and soft plastics. Um, please take these to supermarkets and remove them from your recyclables at home. These just get jammed in our plastic machines. And yeah, we don't currently have the processing um, technology to process these, but there is a plant being built at Avonmouth, which could potentially be something that helps us recycle these in the future. Um, but yeah, for now, you can just take them to supermarkets. That's the best thing to do because they handle it in bulk. Um, but yeah, the legislation is changing around this. And yeah, there's lots of different technology uh, and factories coming. So yeah, it's not going to be a no forever, but it's just a difficulty um, all over the UK for now. Um, we also do a few litter campaigns. So um, you might have seen these little stickers. Um, of seagulls and foxes on some bins around the city, especially in parks and such like. Um, and they basically just say, um, don't feed the litter critters. If the bin is full, please take your rubbish with you. And this is just a, a standard thing that we think people should uh, really think about. Uh, once again, I'm just gonna turn my light on because I realize it's very dark. 
<laughs> just caught myself in the corner, realized I'd done it. Um, yeah, so essentially what we want people to think about, look, if you brought this heavy load of things with you to the park, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to take it home with you if it doesn't fit in a bin. Um, so yeah, it's something that people need to try and um, make a habit essentially. And yeah, some other little um, litter campaign um, posters that you might have seen around the, the city as well, the litter hurts campaign. Um, yeah, we do all sorts of litter picking as well. So at the moment, it's the Great Bristol Spring Clean. Um, and we offer free litter picking kits to schools, community groups, anyone picking in Bristol. As um, Libby said, we've um, teamed up with Sustainable Hive and yeah, they've borrowed our kits many a time to do their wonderful events. Uh, we run two lit picking campaigns a year. So one of them is the Bristol, Great Bristol Spring Clean and we do all sorts of other initiatives as well. Um, we team up with all sorts of people around the UK and Bristol. So the council, businesses, Clean Up UK and of course Sustainable Hive to deliver education and encourage lit picking across the city. And here is me on the sea cycler <laughs> as promised. <laughs> um, it's great. It's definitely one of my favourite days ever. Um, I can't recommend um, going on the sea cycler and talking to Libby and the wonderful team um, about everything they do. So yeah, um, yeah, and really ultimately, it's just about refining and improving processes as we go. Um, you know, nothing is perfect, obviously, um, as things are, but, you know, it, it's just thinking about how we can use the technology to our favour, use the legislation changing to our favour, how we can try and change people's behaviour, how we can, you know, intervene and think about, OK, what is it that we can do to show people that it's in their benefit to recycle more and to waste less and to change their behaviour? Um, a lot of people doing the Waste Nothing Challenge were really surprised by how many things, you know, they can get from a zero waste shop or they can um you know not get in the first place at all so yeah it's just it's just a lot of learning really as we go like within ourselves in our homes but as a business in the council etc um and yeah we can learn from other local authorities and other effective campaigns um yeah and i love rubbish questions uh i really do <laughs> so <laughs> feel free to ask now or email me if you can't think of anything now um, my email address is there, um, but you can also email at hello at bristolwastecompany.co.uk and I will answer through there as well. Noelia, so, we have some, thank you, we have some questions Great. and they both are and are not rubbish uh, or about rubbish. Um, you answered the first two already, which is pretty good going. So Caroline asked about separation of plastic and metal cans, which is yeah, to do with the uh, magnetism. Uh, at the Bristol waste site, waste site. And then Boise asked about uh, black plastic, which is quite depressing that it's an identification issue and how that's not been fixed is astounding at, at the production end. Um, and Julie asked about why won't the council take grass cutting specifically? I, I don't know if the council does Mm. Presumably it does take grass cuttings, but we asked them or Julie asked them about grass cuttings from the wildflower meadow on Clifton Hill. And you mentioned the yeah. Genico site. Presumably that's something like food yeah. waste that would do the same thing. Yeah. So, yeah, really, really good question, Julie. So essentially um, what it is, is because food waste, it just it, the process in the anaerobic digester, it's just a different process than it would be used for green waste, essentially, like a lot of green waste, the stems are really tough and they maybe wouldn't break down in the same way. Um, yeah, it's just green waste ideally would be dealt separately. Um, you know, as I said before, ideally just the same materials will be dealt with together. Like for example, if there's some food waste in the garden waste, um, because that then gets made into compost or other things, um, if there's food in there, it could just cause a lot of issues. Um, and yeah, I understand that obviously, yeah, at Genico, the whatever isn't made, the 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 cake, if you like, uh, that comes out at the end um, is used as fertilizer and so on. But it's just not going to be as good enough, as good quality if there's grass in there rather than the nutrients from um, food, if you like. So yeah, it's, it's a really good question. Again, maybe it's just something about there needs to be some a process that combines both, but just at the moment there isn't one. I'm afraid at the moment it's either food or green waste. 
So yeah, I hope that answers that question. Thank you. And then the next one, I think you've answered well about the problematic nature of eco-plastics and compostable bits. Um, let me say if there was anything else, but yeah, I think that one's done. Uh, Julie asked about plastic film not being recycled. Yeah, so um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to like answer both those questions really. But yeah, I, I think a lot of a lot of it is is people not really understanding that there are a lot of different types of plastics and the different types of plastics have different materials in them and they will not recycle to the same effect. So um, a lot of the plastic that we um, process is um, like different types of PET and then that will get made into pellets. Um, and yeah, just at the moment, as I said, with the with the processing, it just because it's not it's, it's too soft and stretchy essentially. And it's just the machinery is not going to process that um, effectively. It's just not gonna, there needs to be a different machine essentially to deal with that type of plastic, um, which I know is really frustrating because a lot of, um, yeah, like pots will have like the film on top and things like that. But the best thing to do is just remove the film and keep the slightly um, crunch, I like to say crunchier fab <laughs> plastic. Um, yeah so yeah i really do appreciate that it's it's frustrating that you can't recycle it at the moment but yeah plastic film um plastic packaging and things like that most supermarkets do take them so i would say just keep like a little bag aside if you if you're not doing this already um and just build it up and then next time you do a big shop or somebody that you know does a big shop or whatever it might be um can take it for you and then that's that's you know your conscience clean <laughs> if you like uh, you can you know you've done the best thing you can po you possibly can and ultimately these these companies are creating materials that are difficult to recycle um so it's not necessarily you as the consumer uh, it's not necessarily us you know so um yeah a lot of people say oh well why doesn't bristol waste do this why doesn't bristol waste do that we're, we're doing the best we can but um it's ultimately it's there are a lot of problematic materials out there and they are very difficult to recycle. They're made without the process of recycling in mind, a lot of these materials. So yeah, I hope that answers that question. Um, kind of feeds into the next one about whether or not Bristol Waste could potentially pick up more materials, ones that aren't curbside collection in like a different run. But I mean, if every film lid were recyclable in the same way, then there might be an argument for but find a way at the recycling end but you mentioned there being different types of plastics i think there's 90 odd different types of plastics yeah. and if they're all going to be slightly different to treat you can't be expected to have 90 different recycling channels so I think yeah. it needs to go back to standardization at the other end absolutely absolutely um and you know i've i've been really shocked to learn in this job that um you know not all local authorities do things in the same way some of them have a you know a slightly more a complicated process a simpler process some local authorities you just put it all in the same bin and it all gets you know so it's it's difficult because like you say there's no standardized universalized system in place and materials are very very different um and like i said you know it's, it's, it's definitely not perfect um in terms of things that aren't collected at curbside i mean yeah it's you know we do have obviously the bulky waste collections and um you know there's 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 different things in place but it's definitely a big problem um because obviously fly tipping is a big problem and yeah materials that you're not able to recycle yet um from home yeah i can totally understand how you think okay well shouldn't you make it more accessible and easy for people um but that's something that we're working on you know the blue bag wasn't a thing until a few years ago and then all of a sudden everybody's buying things online and there's a lot of cardboard and people at first must have thought oh well why do we need you know people don't recycle that much cardboard but you know most people's blue bags are full now um so it, it very much depends on you know what people buy how behavior changes over time um so yeah it's definitely something to consider you know what other types of materials should be collected from curbside and it's it's something that we're thinking about you know trialing different things there's like conversations around coffee pods for example um and yeah other types of compostable um, materials um there's conversations around nappies um because there's factories that you know recycle just nappies and those sorts of products and if you can imagine you know they, they've got a lot of other things in there which are not <laughs> which i won't name um so yeah it's 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 it's, it's complicated rubbish is complicated but yeah it's definitely 
something we're thinking about, Julie, it's what other things can we provide a service for? But it has to be feasible. It has to be something that is feasible, accessible, makes sense. We have a process for it. And yeah, I agree, Grant. Ideally, we wouldn't have lots of different processes, but yeah, it's just what we have in place at the moment. But yeah, it doesn't mean it will stay like that forever, but that's just the best that we've come up with so far. And like I said, um, we have some of the best recycling rates in the UK. So um, that's testament to people following that system and making sure that everything is separated. So, yeah. OK, thank you. I don't think you can do a lot about this one, but because suggested the collectors take more care of the bins, which get thrown around and degrade. <clears throat> Um, so yeah, thank you Pippa. So I would say um, a lot of people don't like doing this because they see complaining as something that is really, really bad. But if it's something that you've experienced and you've seen a few times, I really urge you to put in a complaint um, through the council um, because then it's something that can be addressed and then that crew can be spoken to. Um, if you can imagine, there's lots of crews around Bristol. Um, I've heard every different type of, you know, comment on the spectrum from oh god yeah they break my boxes to oh they're so amazing they take care to put my boxes back so carefully they always do this for me they always you know so it, it very much depends on you know how quickly your crew needs to get down your street is it a windy day you know it depends on so so many things but if it is a fault of the crew then it does need to be addressed um so yeah if it's something that you see happen quite a lot i would urge you to make a complaint so that it can be addressed um, but yeah, you can order new boxes on the council website and that plastic is recyclable at our um, recycling centres. And if you need to have them collected for us to recycle, then you can request that. So feel free to email us at the hello at bristlewastecompany.co.uk email address if it's if you want to have the boxes collected or something like that. But yeah, I urge you to make a complaint if it's something that you're worried about. Thanks, Noelia. We've got another six questions, so I think we probably, if hopefully it's okay to go through them, but maybe no more. Otherwise, we're going to run quite a, sure. quite a lot over. Um, it's been asked about, I don't know whether it be Bristol Waste or if you know of other companies using future technologies. The one mentioned was about bacteria to decompose and I think mushrooms. Yeah. Fungi. Yeah, um, I, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Julie. So yeah, it's, it's a really good, good question. Um, as you can tell, I'm a bit of a waste nerd and I learn more every day. Um, it's something that I've heard of, yeah, happen elsewhere. Um, I don't know anything about Bristol doing that just yet. Obviously, as you can imagine, um, it's problematic in other ways. Like we don't know the full effects of, you know, is it going to affect, um, yeah, wildlife or, you know, there, there could be all sorts of concerns really. Um, but yeah, nothing as of yet um, happening in Bristol. But yeah, exciting to see how it succeeds or how it develops elsewhere. And maybe it is something that we'll take on. Who knows? I don't rule it out, but not just yet. <laughs> Thank you. Next one is about tours. Um, do you still do tours of the facility? Yes, we do. Um, we've just started doing them again. Um, that's why we made that transfer station video as well, is because we still had a lot of people keen to do the tours but we weren't able to during the pandemic um but if you're interested uh pop us an email i'll just put the email address in the chat box if you're interested um we can look into possible options for you they used to be on fridays didn't they Is yeah it, now, now we do, so yeah we don't do regular ones uh anymore i'm afraid hopefully they will come back um at some point but at the moment it's sort of like as and when so like groups of um, yeah community groups and so on um, we are only just started to bring them back so um, bear with us it may not be um, you know like next week if you ask for it this week or something like that but yeah if you email us um, we'll see what we can do for you cool that's better because I can't do Fridays <laughs> uh, uh, plastic lining of coffee cups and lids you mentioned that when the cardboard goes off to I can't remember what county it was now what happens with the other two components yes so yeah good question um so the plastic lining um and the lids yeah so this is um this is yeah from the, in the bins you can obviously see that we uh, separate them out so the plastic lining because it's removed at the paper mill um I'm actually unsure where they take it I would imagine because our plastic in Bristol goes to a company called JPlas and they mostly process within the UK. Um, sometimes they uh, send it to Holland because there's demand for plastic there and the factories there. Um, so it's a good question. I will find out for you and I can email you the answer. 
Um, because yeah, because it's not where our plastic normally goes to. It could be that the lids go to JPLAS, but the lining, I'm not sure where the lining goes. So I'm happy to, I'll write that down and I'll get back to you, Grant, for that one. Thank you. And in the meantime, everybody's going to start using reusables. Yes, exactly. That I did say that, you know, shout out to reusables. <laughs> um, thank you. And then Libby asked about with wine bottles, whether we ought to be removing the metal bits on the sleeve. Yeah, good question. Um, so um, the if it's easy to remove, remove it. Um, obviously with, with metal, it can, yeah, it can be like, especially the sort of the thing that spins around the lid. If you like, I can, that is quite difficult to remove sometimes and can be quite sharp. Um, so just be careful. Um, what you can do with like little loose bits of metal and foil, uh, this is something that I didn't say before, is that if they're really small to ensure that they do get recycled, you can put them inside something else of the same material. So let's say a Kit Kat wrapper, you could put that in a Coke can if you don't have that much foil or this little um, yeah, lining around the, the wine bottle that you're talking about. If you can get it off safely, you can put it inside um, as well because they're made of similar materials. Um, but yes, ideally get them off. But if you don't, it's not the end of the world. But yeah, if you if you consider like the fact that there's just going to be less metal in that glass bale, then the quality of that glass is just going to increase. Um, and there is a world glass shortage at the moment uh, because of sand, um, the sand needed <laughs> to create the glass. So yeah, glass is a very, very sought after material. So the more you can, you can keep glass around, the better really. So yeah, good job. Cool. Alison asked about um, how best to campaign against the initial manufacture of non-recyclable materials. I would say petition companies, boycott their products if you know it's not recyclable. Um, write to your MP about the standardisation issue. Yep. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Those are, those are really, really good things to do. Um, just before you guys came on, I urged Libby to write to Pringles about their tube. Um, yeah. I would say especially do it with companies that write it all over their packaging. It's part of their branding. Um, Innocent got in trouble recently because they did some greenwashing around their plastic um, and they had to own up and say, oh, actually, yeah, that wasn't quite accurate because this and this happens. So, yeah, hold them accountable. You know, if they say something is recyclable and actually it's not easily recyclable um, or it's compostable, but it's not actually compostable. Um, yeah, write to them, call them out hold them accountable um yeah it's it's or yeah boycott if you can but you know both a mix of both i think a mix of all of the things you said and more i think <laughs> yeah. cool just want to quickly mention what you said earlier about mixed materials being problematic and just to say people know this but tetra pack it's an, a nightmarish mixed material and um, there's I think there's a lot of greenwashing that's gone on there as well um then the last question um, I didn't note down who it was from, but it was whether or not Bristol Waste campaign on legislative changes. Um, wow. Um, it's, it's, I think because we're owned by the council, we can't necessarily campaign. Like we, we can push for change and we can create, you know, systems to make the change if you like. Um, but in terms of campaigning, um, I'm not sure. I mean, we do we do all sorts of behavior change and lots to get people to think about the impact of waste and things like that. So we can do that side of things. Um, but in terms of legislative um, changes, I'm not sure that's something that I would need to look into. I'm happy to if you give me your email address, um, Else, I'd be happy to look into that for you. But yeah, I have a feeling that um, <clears throat> maybe we we don't. Maybe we can't, but I'm not sure, to be honest. I'd be happy to look into that. So if you just pop your email address, I'll email you. The data that you create and all that you do should be enough, really. That like All the changes should have been made based on the reality of what recycling is and isn't. But, yeah, clearly we need to do more. Thanks. Thanks, Noelia and everyone. Um, I think we should stop there. Um, just gone a little bit over. Really enjoyed both of your talks and all the questions are really, really good. Yeah, thank you everybody. Yeah, there's, you know, it's, it's always, always more that can be done, like you say, Grant, but yeah, thank you everyone. <laughs>